Hey guys, welcome back to another fantastic episode of UAP Studies. And I do say fantastic today because we are delving into the realm of consciousness, remote viewing, and how it relates to UAPs, UFOs, aliens. Uh, very interesting subject today, Michael. Uh, it's something Indeed. that I've I know very little of on Ingo Swan, but we have uh, Ingo Swan student Ali Flippin who is joining us today from Tennessee, actually, uh, and uh, we're we're looking forward to uh, delve into what Ingo Swan was capable of doing, what he saw what it's all about and what foundation he set up for people going forward. Very interesting because up to that point, we didn't really know much about the psyops that the governments were up to, but it sounds like not only was Ingo Swan very capable in remote viewing, but they also had very capable, um, almost psychic and, and uh, uh, telepathic people already working for them. Indeed, so yeah. Yeah, that's scary. It's like, okay, well, Bizarre he was- our history of America. It uh, is, America and very much him. Stuff. Yeah. yeah, so uh, how are you doing, Michael? How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. It's a lovely, warm day here in Charleston, and I'm not too far from Ellie. She's up in Tennessee in the sort of deeper parts of Appalachia. How are you, Ellie? I'm doing great, and, and I'm so excited to be on your podcast. Yeah, we're excited to have you. Yeah. And this one was one of the very first truly- extraordinary people that i ever knew existed after I, I started getting interested in these subjects and i've uh i've not read a ton of his work uh to be honest but i know lots of great anecdotes about him and i'm super excited to to be able to talk to somebody who knew him so intimately you were his niece right 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 his niece you know never his student I, um neither was my mother i mean ingo said we weren't um qualified to be his students he what you were qualified was it the psychic qualified. ability he was talking about or i don't know i think he was talking about for remote viewing and, uh, and who knows you know so for me i know um from a whole different perspective right like to me he's uncle ingo i actually have a a photo maybe i can show you so this hmm. is me as a freshman in high school with him i mean look at the perm it's pretty what funny. year is this ellie <laughs> this is 1982 1982 wow. 1982. Yeah. Now, for those who are listening, uh, it, it's a picture of Ellie when she was younger, along with yeah. Ingo, who's uh, her uncle, quite older. But he's, uh, how old would you say he's in that picture? Maybe 40? Uh, so he was born in 1933. So let's say. Oh, 80. wow. Yeah. I didn't think yeah. he was that old. <laughs> wow. 53, 50. So we, so, so what? 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. So, um, yeah. 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 But yeah. it, it was a, a wasn't a guy that looked, you know, because you think Ingo Swan, you think remote viewing, you kind of think, okay, well, frizzy hair, kind of like that UFO guy from Ancient Aliens, right? You kind of picture that, but it wasn't that case. He was like, he always dressed well, like a nice suit jacket, tie, like he presented himself well, very intelligent, but he had this ability that is amazing that most people are not capable of doing. And I say most people probably a very small percentage of people on this planet are capable of doing. So just for the viewers and for ourselves, if you could just give us a crash course, you know, uh, like mm -hmm. Michael calls it a, a Ingo Swan 101 right. course. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, as I said, you know, I'm so grateful and excited for this opportunity, especially to share Ingo and his story with you. And like I said, you know, um, he was my uncle. So I have him, I know him from a different perspective, right? I don't know him as this, you know, this great psychic. And, and certainly I live with him three times during my lifetime. So I got to see him behind the scenes, you know, as a person. And I got to see how he interacted with people. So I have this, you know, broader perspective of him, which I think has helped me to kind of navigate through his various writings and, and what have you. But um, he has put out, he called it um, sort of a historical narrative on remote viewing, but it's also somewhat of a memoir. It's called Remote Viewing the Real Story. He put it out at first on his uh, website, Superpowers of the Biomind, but it's also available as a PDF on ingoswan.com. So, if, you know, I'm going to just kind of do a very basic narrative, but if people are looking for more information, he's got 58 chapters. I mean, he he meant to finish it like so many things, but, you know, um, 
life caught up with him or the end of life caught up with him. But it, it's a wonderful sort of perspective on what, how he got to be where he was at SRI and all of the people involved, because he would say, you know, it wasn't just him. There are over 500 people, I think he says, involved. And, and so this is a bigger, broader story. And I think he tried to tell that bigger, broader story. So, And, and just, just to jump in real quick, for yeah. for um, for um listeners who, who aren't aware and might be misled into thinking that Ingo just didn't finish uh, things, he was an extremely prolific person. I mean, he was an artist, first of all, and a truly extraordinary visionary artist. Um, his work reminds me a lot of like Alex Gray's work or something. But um, so he's <laughs> an extremely prolific body of work. The fact that he didn't finish the 58 chapters is just to do with the fact that he was doing so many things. So so you mentioned SRI, the Stanford Research Institute, yes, yes. actually at Stanford doing work with the government. Can you start us there, maybe? Yeah. So, OK, so I kind of well, let's let's sort of say, like, you know, he didn't just come like nothing just happens. Right. There's always some sort of process. And so for Ingo. As a child, he did have these kind of like outside what we would call society's normal expected experiences, right? So he's had out-of-body experiences when he was like two or three during an operation. He had a precognitive experience where he felt like there was going to be a fire in the house. And um, he warned his parents and like pleaded with them to get out of the house. And there, and there actually was a fire later that night. He wanted to be called by a different name. So his name was actually Ingo Douglas Swan. His father was Ingo Swan. So the Douglas to kind of help separate them. But he hated the name. He didn't want the name. Uh, he wanted to be called what he was called before. So he refused to answer to, to Doug or Dougie, which um, led him to being, he says, taken to the coal shed and... <laughs> with his father's razor belt. And after that, oh, he, God. Yeah. he went by Dougie, right? Um, so he really, you know, he had these experiences and he was fortunate because he had a grandmother who had similar experiences. So he sort of had a, you know, a, a, a backstop, if you will. So, you know, he's in Telluride, it's a mining community. I mean, his father was a miner, his grandfather was a miner. It's very, you know, it's rural. And so, you know, to have these experiences as a child, he was fortunate to have a grandparent who could help him navigate all of that. So um, he, he goes to Westminster College. He goes into the Army. He serves on the staff of I.D. White, which is the general in charge of the whole um, Far East. He's serving on his, his clerical staff. And so he has a, an experience where um, he has a warning about being shot. And he actually moves out of the way and a bullet goes by him. So, I mean, these kinds of things happen to him before he even gets to New York. Like a like a spider sense, you know? Yeah, like a yeah. spider sense. Yeah. I gotcha. Yeah. So, so when he gets to New York, he wants to be an artist, but he quickly finds out that being an artist in New York is extremely difficult. So he, he starts working at the UN on the clerical staff and he begins to study everything. So he's studying the early occultists like Rudolf Steiner's um, at Rudolf Steiner Center, Alice Bailey's Arcane School. He starts studying astrology, studying the Fourth Way, tons of religious texts, Eastern Western philosophers, Western you know psychologists. The list goes on and on and on. So he's coming with a really um, flavorful background of esoteric information, right? And he ends up um, befriending Zelda Suplees, running Reed Erickson's um, foundation for him. And one of the things they're interested in, that mostly in, in um, trans and trans studies, but also in, in, in various psychic studies. And she's holding a party and a young couple shows up. They have a new camera and they decide they're all going to go into the back bedroom and they're gonna, there's like a special camera to like an infrared camera and they black out all the curtains and they want everybody to think about a light above their head and they start taking photographs. And when they get the film developed, Ingo is the only one with a ball of light over his head. Yeah. So, and that photograph is actually in his archives at the University of West Georgia. Um, and, you know, immediately that opens the door, right? This travels on the psychic gossip line in New York, which is very, very prominent. And the door swings open. And all of a sudden, all of these people want to do experiments with them, right? So, so his, his first kind of foray into this is with um, 
a person by the name of Clee Baxter. He had been the CIA's interrogation specialist and developer of um, um, interrogation machines. So like, you know, like you hook things up and I guess you would like, a, anyway. Like um, lie detector machines, machines right? Well, like a di lie detector, yeah. Like an yeah. early oh, lie Oh, okay. Not not torture machines like we're shocking Not torture people. machines, but like but, uh, okay. lie something with electronic equipment. And he's Don't be morbid, in Michael. Yeah, so he's very interested. Cleve is very interested in plants. So that kind of communication between species that's happening. So he hooks his plants up to his machines and he has Ingo think about harming them. And to see if the plants will react, if there's some sort of reaction when Ingo thinks about harming them. And it does, or so the equipment goes off. And and after a while, that when Ingo doesn't harm them, like striking a match or something, they start to figure out, oh, he's not going to harm me. And the reaction kind of goes down. And that leads to him starting to work with Gertrude Smidler. And this is the first time he does sort of the foray into what's called um, psychokinesis. So being able to manipulate things with your mind. And in this case, Dr. Smidler has put um, therm thermometers into sealed containers and as asking Ingo to uh, affect the temperature reading, which he's able to do. And what is you know also interesting about that work is that he was able to do it repeatedly. And this had been the issue with all uh, parapsychology experiments that kind of started from the, the late 1800s up until this time. So you're talking like over 100 years. No one can really produce these things consistently repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And if they are there's always been a sense of fraud to them. And so this has always been the thing that's kind of dogged parapsychology research is their repeatable experiment. So the very fact that he's able to do this repeatedly with Dr. Schmeinler is huge. You know, this and is just to like- jump in, it, it seems yeah. like one of, the, one of the consistent problems in parapsychology is that you'll get our initial positive results that then drop off fairly quickly afterwards. Um, right. And, and that sort of, um, that sort of pattern is repeatable, but the assumption from critics is always that, well, you just didn't record any of the, any of the negative results beforehand. You started recording the positive results when they happened, and then it regressed back to the mean and you didn't get them anymore. And so you're actually just giving us fraudulent data. However, all the people who do these parapsychological uh, replication studies will tell you that that's not what happened. And, and if anybody is really interested in this, um, just looking at the data, there's a great book by uh, author Dean Radin, who's a uh, I think it's an engineer or a physicist who's got a PhD in some sort of science called Real Magic, and and I definitely recommend readers check it out, and that that'll sort of help settle the question about the strength of the evidence. But we're not going to have to go into all that. To, yeah. We're just trying to tell the story today. So back back to you, Ellie. Okay. Sorry for that. Yeah. So so then that leads him to opening the door to working at the American Society for Cyclical Research, and. There, Dr. Carlo, Carlos Oslis and Janet Lee Mitchell are working on out-of-body experiments. So that was really Carlos Oslis's kind of big thing at the ASPR. And it's through those types of experiments that he and Mitchell coined the term remote viewing. So in those experiments, he says he's, le he's leaving his body, he's going to a location, viewing what's in that kind of box, and then... Um, drawing it out for them. And that's how they kind of come up with the term remote viewing. And he's able to do this consistently, almost like 100% of the time. And when they go to publish this uh, with the ASPR journals, the board refuses to publish the results of these experiments because they said they're too good to be true. <laughs> There's just no way you could do this 100% of the time. And Ingo's like, oh, screw you guys. You know, like I did this. Uh, and I can't believe you guys, of all people, you are parapsychologists, would not want to publish this. And so it's Cleve who's, who has actually now at this point, um, Hal Putoff has come on board. So it's at this time. So this is 72. So I kind of back up. So in 1971, Hal Putoff, who's very interested in quantum electronics, he's, he's a, a, a very solid laser physicist. He's got several patents to his name. He comes over from Stanford University and he comes on board at SRI. 
And, you know, just you have to understand SRI's business model is contract based. So researchers have to get their own funding and, you know, more often not it's governmental based. And so he's starting to look into kind of the, the quantum realm and what's happening at that kind of he calls it tactian levels. And he starts to put out papers so he can start to like generate some sort of government um, backing, right? And Cleve Baxter comes across this article, and here's Ingo saying, I'm done with the ASPR, I'm done with parapsychology, you know, they can't believe me. And Cleve says, hey, maybe you should get in touch with this guy with put off because he seems to be interested in what you're doing. So it's at that point that Ingo calls put off, and they have a discussion and put off says, hey, come out here to SRI and we'll play around, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. So this playing around happens in July of 1972, and it involves taking Ingo to Stanford's physics department, where there's a cork detector. It's buried under eight feet of cement. It's shielded by frequencies and emissions. And until that point in time, and it's been there for several years, um, it has done nothing but this. So I, like the readout mm -hmm. has been just a straight line. Um, so put off takes him there. And around Ingo are Stanford University physicists and put off. And, and so Ingo just begins to like ask psychic out, right? So he starts to just draw what he's seeing. And as he's drawing, he perturbs it. And that means like he's perturbing the readout. Like I said, it had been straight. All of a sudden it starts to go like this. Okay. And this, like the physicists just like are gobsmacked. Like they can't. They can't even comprehend what they're seeing. Because so it's never, never been happened. done before. Never been done. It's only okay. ever been a straight line. No, in, in fact, I mean, this is a, an ongoing problem is in physics is detection of these these really uh, like weakly interacting particles. We we will bury these detectors really, really deep in the earth, hoping that all the other particles that do interact with other forms of, of matter will will just be filtered out. They'll hit something in the in the ground or whatever. Um, and then these these other particles that that seem to kind of just just zoop through normal matter will eventually get through that and then we'll interact with with this detector that we have down there. But we've been super duper bad at being able to find these things. I mean, it looks almost like the theory itself might be wrong, but um, but that wouldn't be a problem for Ingo because Ingo, uh, I don't think at least is saying that he perturbed a quark detector by actually uh, sending quarks to it. He probably would say that he did something something else. So he's able to actually get some uh, register out of this um, extremely well-defined and expensive piece of machinery that has henceforth done almost nothing. Said nothing and was classified. So not only does he perturb it, <laughs> he draws it. He draws it, which is just now freaking the, the other physicists out, right? Because not only has he done this, he, he's drawn something that he should never have been able to draw. And, you know, put off doesn't know what it looks like. So he's not reading put off's mind or any other minds. Right. So he's, so, you know, after that, um, kind of laser physicist, Russell Tark comes on board of SRI. Right. So then as the story goes, the, the U S clandestine world began to provide funds. This would be CIA money. And it starts with a small grant, right? Because SRI has to get money. It's a small grant from the, the CIA. It's called the Biofields Measurement Contract. And it starts in August of 1972. And it's a direct result of Ingo's psychokinesis happenings. Okay. Um, and this grant is for what um, put off and tar call psychoenergetic work. So, you know, Psycho here there's psychoenergetic. So, you know, so I'll try to. Yeah, so I'll try to define these terms because I think these terms float around and um, hopefully it can, you know, help illuminate what they might mean. Sure. Um, yeah. yeah, so put off and Targ define that as the perception of information through an unknown channel and the perturbance of equipment through non-physical means. That's what they're looking at. So when they say we're looking at psychoenergetic, it's getting information from some unknown way and in perturbing things, so psychokinesis, right? Sure. And, and Russell and, and Targ and, and Putoff are both deeply in, involved in the UAP world history too. I mean, Putoff is still publishing uh, articles on on UAP and things. So this is there's a lot of interesting cross, crossover between these figures, even though at the time they might not have been working on uh, on these subjects. Yeah. 
So, you know, based on that, so they start, you know, so now Ingo sort of folds in this stuff that he was doing at the ASPR, right? These kind of outbounder, like it sends somebody out and then they'll draw or photograph what they see and this person will stay here and, you know, uh, draw out what's happening with the other person or, you know, putting things in a box and seeing what things are in the box. And because of their successes in that, the CIA, you see, I'm funds start to flow to SRI. And, you know, more so than just that simple grant that they had back in August. And what they're looking for is to determine whether these, and they call them anomalous mental phenomenon. So again, they put a different term, but let's just call it psychoenergy. So their term is anomalous mental phenomenon. Existed. But not only did it exist, can we use it? And can we apply it to problems of national interest, right? So the ultimately, they're looking for a refinement of something that can be used for, um, let's just call it espionage or reconnaissance purposes, right? There has to be a, a tool. It needs to be a tool in a toolkit. And Ingo, the first step in this way is a project that Ingo represents and, or uh, recommends and then also represents is in 1973 called scan eight. And so that's sort of like scanning mentally by coordinate. And again, the emphasis is always on making it operational. Can we make it an espionage tool? So, so scanning right. by coordinate, it's like I would, somebody would give me a, a set of like literal GPS coordinates and would tell them it would be just a two, two strings of numbers. And they would say, tell me what's there. And I would have to give some description and you're saying um, the, the goal is always to make it operational. That is, they're interested not just in whether you give like some accurate information, they're interested in whether that information is accurate enough and the kind of information that they could use in an actual like military operation. Is that the idea? Yeah, that's absolutely the idea. I mean, you know, okay. otherwise, the government, otherwise, why would you spend money on it, right? Yeah, I mean, even if it's accurate, looking, it has to be useful. Yeah. Right, right. So, I mean, they're looking for something because um, they're looking for something. If you have somebody who's able to see something at a spot and you don't have to use an on-site asset, you don't have to have equipment, you don't have to have all the things that might expose you, I mean, wouldn't you want to have that? Right? Absolutely, I mean, you take yeah. away all those things that might put your... Um, reconnaissance mission at risk, right? So, so of course, this seems like a great tool, right? And so I think when people think about this, they call it Stargate, right? This espionage tool, mm -hmm. right? And that's sort it of was like- a project Stargate, that we know. Project so. Stargate. Like yeah. when you talk about it, it was, it, okay. But really remote viewing as this kind of tool started with the army under its intelligence security command group, INSCOM. And it started because they launched their own kind of version. So not Ingo's and SRI's version. It's an altered states of consciousness out of body type of RV. And so okay. RV being remote viewing. It, that project was called Gondola Wish. In hmm. Gondola, the army contracted with Robert Monroe and the Monroe Institute in 1978. You know, and noting that altered states of consciousness can be achieved by like drugs, hypnosis, meditation, but in Monroe's case, it was through audio simulation. Okay. And when so, the Monroe Institute was used by the, the government to, to try to understand um, how all sorts of psychic phenomena can be used, right? They, they eventually produced this, this bizarre document called something like the, um, what is it, the initiation process or, or something like that, uh, that, that explains in like 60 pages why the, why the government believes that sort of physical the, the the official physics explanation for how the government thinks psychic phenomena can be uh, can actually work we can put a link to that document in the end but so the Monroe institute is doing all this stuff and they still exist and they're doing all sorts of weird brain and they're all doing all sorts of, right binaural right. beats and all that kind of stuff um they're no. still around okay right, so, right. so yeah. they, they used the Monroe institute for what again so it's called uh the program was called gondola, gondola wish. wish and gondola wish um turned kind of operational under a project called Real Flame. And it was a joint DIA Army program that started in 1980 and was sunsetted in 1983. So sometimes there can be a lot of confusion, right? Like you hear all these like names. So I just kind of wanted to put a mm -hmm. step by step so to help people kind of see the, the timeline of how that went. Now for Ingo, he would create his own kind of 
what we would call controlled remote viewing and a set of protocols for that. And he did that with Putoff. And he really says that Putoff was the real father of this um, because it was their work together to create these protocols. But um, there are lots of contracts that show that he this was a proprietary technique to him. Okay, so it, his brand of remote viewing is controlled remote viewing. Um, and he called it an intellectual discipline, the protocols of which allow for the flow of information in stages. So not leaving your body, not entering or being in an altered state, not telepathy, which he describes as being, you know, telepathy being um, with one in like, as if you were with them in their other mind. Okay. Mm -hmm. So not channeling entities in intellectual information gathering process from which anyone can be trained in this ability. Although Ingo would probably say ability is the most, is the wrong word, but he's using it because it most readily resonates with what you and I have come to know it as. Uh, but the way he articulates it is part of our inbuilt, sort of our in built perpetual awareness systems, something mm -hmm. we need to remember that we have, and we can actually bring under our own conscious intellectual control. And you know, maybe I could just deviate here for a moment because I think yeah, this please. is important. Um, so Ingo would say everything we need is already within us, but it's being deliberately kept from us. Um, and I put this on X, I posted this recently. He's, you know, and, it, and it comes from a book that we published after he passed away. Um, and he calls it the equalizing forces. He says they're a serious business. They don't care about truth and facts. And with all other unif uniforming procedures, the equalizer will adopt the final solution, which is death, right? To kill it off. So opposite of that is the rebirth principle. And um, the opposite is an energy and it comes from the transformative universe. It's called resurrection. So what he's saying is we can re resurrect these things on ourselves. Right. So we can subvert what's being held back from us um, and to get a sense of what might that be? What's more inside us? You know, in reality, his books, Reality Boxes, he talks about human experiencing and particularly exceptional human experiencing. And that would be his word for abilities. So things that people might experience interspecies communication, like talking between you and your pet, transformable experiences like exceptional experiences, especially with human performance, or it, particularly we see this in the mental arts, right? That kind of flow experience that one might have in martial arts. Out-of-body experiences, empathy, um, aura sensing, vibe sensing, your experience with a guardian angel, some sort of kundalini awakening, that kind of ooh aha moment, um, deja vu, premonitions, where you just kind of get inspiration out of the blue, abductee, UFO experiences, near-death near experiences, demon experiences, and so forth. So he's, right? just, so, put, he's putting them all in the same bucket, like any sort of like weird anomalous human experience that you can understand. You've had a dream where a thing happened and then it happened. Yeah. Or like you thought can about I, a friend and they called you that moment. Can, or Yeah. Can, can I tell you guys a yeah. trippy a trippy one that happened to me i'm a twin uh, and when i was about 20 21 years old i used to work at this meat packing plant at four o'clock in the morning so i would always go to bed about eight nine o'clock at night and i was living with uh my, my my brother bruce and my mother at the time was staying with us and i had a dream um he took off for the evening he went to walk to our friend's house and i had a dream while he was gone that he got jumped by three guys and it was a bad dream. So I woke up at four to get up. My mom gets up, makes a pot of coffee. She's like, did you hear what happened to Bruce last night? I'm like, no, he got jumped by three guys. And I was like, what? Like, I dreamt that. I don't know if it's my twin connection, but I dreamt that while it happened. Uh, so that's the only time in my life that that's ever happened where I had a predictive dream of what was happening to my twin brother. So I totally get where you're coming from, but it is an, it's a one-off but it still creeps Here's, me out. Let me, let me give you a, a one off too. I, uh, this was like four days ago. I was in the middle of a, of one of my normal stupid dreams that I have. that just doesn't make any sense. I was like driving around and I saw a, an enormous camel on the side of the road. And I was like a camel in Charleston. I have got to take pictures of this. Right. So in my dream, I'm like trying to fiddle with my phone, 
trying to take a picture of a camel like a moron thinking that this is real you know because i'm like dumb enough to think like oh this is a thing that's actually happening yeah it's legit um, the camel yeah this is <laughs> strange about this i'm just special i just saw a camel. but then then uh boom uh something happens and i'm in a vehicle and my vehicle is rolling back and i guess oh i guess i must have been in my car while i was taking a picture of the animal i get out and i look and my front tire is busted and the side of the car has had a big panel, like a big like strip of metal ripped down out of it. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? And then I'm in reality, I'm woken out of my dream by a phone call. And I pick it up and it's my girlfriend. And she's like, I just got sideswiped by a guy uh, and it burst the tire. And and then when I look at the car, there's he had he had hit her while she was moving this way. Right. So there's this long scrape all the way down the side of the car and actually it wasn't the same tire i thought it was the back tire in my dream it was actually the front tire but i was awakened from a dream in which the thing happened to me pretty much exactly as in reality but it had happened to my girlfriend and what i mean i don't even know how do you calculate the probability of such an event randomly happening but there's a part of you despite your best attempts to be like a deeply rational person that says there's just no fucking way <laughs> there's no way mm-hmm. that this just what are, the odds? What are the odds? Of it. Yeah. Right. So, so Ingo is taking all of the weird stuff. Jason had a UAP experience. I had a, a, a weird dream. He had an, a, a predictive dream. All that stuff is all in the same bucket. And he's saying that's like, what did he call it? Exceptional human experience or something? Yeah. So he like would that. say it's part and parcel of our perceptual awareness systems. But there's something right. trying to suppress our ability to, 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 to use that. What, Tim, can you tell us about that? Like, what is it an actual group of people or is it just some force in the universe that sort of counteracts this the way that like there's gravity and anti-gravity or something? Or does he even have a theory about what that is? Um, I mean, he calls it different things, right? So in Resurrecting the Mysterious, he calls it the societal equalizer. Um, in an interview with Art Bell, when he was talking about penetration and remote viewing, he actually called it the powers that rule this planet. So mm-hmm. there's something capable of suppressing these potentials within us, our, these potentials of our perceptual awareness systems, right? And because he says we are endowed with this potential. We just need to activate it. We need to nurture it. We need to hone it. Um, and we can do that but we have to get out from under this oppression, right? And um, that's as far as like I've seen it, sort of like a societal group effort, um, you know, Did ultimately- Did you ask him I, about that ever though? I mean like- Yeah, I mean like, mm. so so I have kind of, kind of understand it to be something close to what we would think of as the new world order, something like that. Okay, that well, at least the evil a, that runs it, right? Right, the evil yeah. that runs it is somehow capable, right? And 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 I'll kind of get into like his book Penetration, but it's that same concept that there's something out there that's suppressing us that knows that we could be powerful, and if we were powerful, we would know about them and their objectives. I, I sense a little bit of hesitation in you saying new world order, though. I mean, is that because you yourself aren't convinced that, that there is such a thing or that um, you're just hesitant to talk about it? Uh, I, you know, I absolutely believe there's something. I absolutely believe it. I mean, there are, I've gone through all of Ingo's writings, various different ones, and I think that's probably the closest he came to describing it. I mean, I mean, ultimately, he called it the world order of perverts. So that was his term. He was probably dead on because it looks that way, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah. Right. But he's yeah. also right. an artist. So- like, he's a provocative person, right? I mean, he he uses this sort of, like, uh, you know, explosive language uh, yeah. in, in, in his normal life. So distilling out what, what he might have actually really meant by that i mean does he think there's a cabal of perverts out there psychically oppressing the world or is it oh he really like really well i think he thinks there are um interdimensional beings that have human actors yeah who are working sort of on their behalf or something yeah i mean i think he saw kind of like a pyramid um and the best way that like i found this was in his book on um, what will happen to you when the Soviets take over. He wrote it in 1980. 
it's about like the Soviet Union taking over America in some respects. Maybe that's very close to communism. What's happening now? You know, taking over in Canada it's, sure is <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so, um, but he was you know adamantly against it. Um, he believed, you know, that communism was a suppression of individuality and of our ability. So I think, you know, kind of blended well with his thinking. Um, but he said, even in the communist regime, right, there's the top, there's a group of people that, you know, the rich people who kind of rule over the mass, and then there's yeah. something over them. Oh, and I so think what he's saying the is... Oligarchy isn't the top, or the, the communist party right. isn't really at the top, there's, there's some... There's something even over that. So if you looked at it as a pyramid, the new world order is working on behalf of something else. So there's something else that has these human these human um, actors working for them. And it's that something an, else. He was himself an oppressed person, though. I mean, he was gay in a time when it was, I mean, to say it was unacceptable is such a vast understatement. I mean, people were murdered. Simply not tolerated. Gay. Yeah, not tolerated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Right. And uh, here, so, I mean, in fact, in fact, even illegal, and yet he has top security clearance, which I think is pretty awesome. <laughs> well, here's but here's the thing that I find very interesting with the government mm -hmm. is that it they don't care about your personal life; they care about what you're able to do for them. Uh, and I find that interesting. Even you were mentioning about how they were, you know, experiencing or in the '70s with you know psychedelic drugs, and I mean. There is some the psycho, psycho. I'm having a hard time saying the psychological uh, affecting drugs that does enhance or makes different synapses in the brain connect that have never connected before, and make you expand in consciousness, or maybe just makes you aware of the numbness and vibration in which we operate on an everyday basis, which is very low. Um, they recently did a study of what causes somebody to be the most authentic and has the highest vibration. And they think it's when somebody's a hundred percent authentic in themselves and, you know, no shyness, no insecurities, just confident in themselves. They have the highest vibrations. And I think, you know, for Ingo and people like him, that's probably one aspect. Uh, the other one is the, the, the creativeness of these people, um, the willingness to invent, to create same thing with Nikola Tesla. He said, the best thing is to be alone and to just listen, source will tell you what to do. And look at what we wouldn't be able to do this if it wasn't for Nikola Tesla right now, right? So there is a thing. We just got to pay attention. I mean, the slogan of the podcast is, are you paying attention? And that may stand for a lot of things and myself included. Like this is a realm I've never really delved into before was the, what are the capabilities of humans and most importantly is the communication because this is UAP related podcast telepathically between entities and humans. And here we are thinking like, how are we going to communicate with aliens? Well, we don't need to use words. They don't speak English. They don't speak French or German. It's telepathically. They transfer their emotions, their thoughts, their ideas straight to you. You're connected at all times. That's trippy. And I think we're capable of that. I think they're, they're demonstrating that this is built in us. We just don't ever use it. And I think Ingo and people like him were the ones that were sort of pioneering, like, hey, we have a sixth sense. Maybe we should start using it. It's brilliant. Right, to, right, right. And especially to protect ourselves, right? So if they have, if they're using it against us, that means they have an open channel into us. But we don't have an open channel into them, and we don't have an, a way to block them. Right. I think that's like a one way we, radio. That's like, like, right. Like we are always receiving. Right. But we can't turn it off. And that's what Ingo saying is we need to take intellectual control of these things so we can turn these things off or we can activate them and be prepared for what comes over when we do kind of thing. That sort of makes sense. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. We're, we're, yeah. we're following you. Uh, okay. What? what what I would like to delve into um, is, is obviously because now in, uh, he's your uncle was involved in all these programs, um, you know, and the thing is, it's not like his life is rainbows or anything like that at the time. Everybody has messy lives in the in the process, but he's con he's doing these programs. How does he get involved now? With okay, the, yeah. yeah, with the remote viewing and the CIA and its relation to the UAP. 
Okay, so I'll I'll sort of just finish this so that so people have an understanding of just remote viewing. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a set of videos on ingoswan.com with Bob Durant. He trained in CRV with Ingo in 1994 when Jin Schnabel came to train with Ingo, doing research for his book on the program called in the books called Remote Viewers. Um, and Bob Durant walks through the CRV stages. So like Ingo's protocols is information comes to you in stages. So that it begins at a very minimal level and it builds over time. Okay. And Bob does a really good job of walking through what those stages are. So they're on the CRV section of ingoswan.com. They're also on YouTube. Um, Ingo then used these protocols to train a group of students sent to him by Army Intelligence. He was hired by the Army to directly do this, and that was under a program called Center Lane. It started in 1982. Tom McNear was his first student. This program then became operational under a project called Sunstreak in 1986, before ultimately the whole thing was renamed Stargate in 1990, right? So when everybody thinks of Stargate, it didn't just happen. It was a progression of various programs. That makes sense. And so in all RV changed hands between Army Intelligence, the Air Force, the DIA, and the CIA, and lasted until 1995 when it was retired. Um, and then Ingo, for his part, retired from the program in around 88, 89, but started to really limit his involvement in 1985. And this is when put off left the program and the whole program was transferred to the DIA. Right. It's um, it's, it's like, uh, you know, a, a card shuffle, you know, those uh, yes. those hustlers on the streets, like you got to keep your eye on the queen and, you know, <laughs> go, go and find it. It's exactly what they do with these programs. They did the same with, uh, you know, Project Grudge, Project Blue Book, like they just keep changing names. Right, right. So I think so I think that kind of like, did I answer the question? I mean, you know, ultimately the government was interested in espionage tool and this kind of fit the bill because it really gave them a hands-off reconnaissance tool right. to put in their, in their toolkit, right? And, you so, know, probably why, you know, it lasted as long as it lasted too. So so at this point in uh, 95, Stargate gets, um, or, or the, the remote viewing um, project under Stargate gets canned. And I have a... Um, I have a document here called, uh, it's from the CIA's uh, reading room called An Evaluation of Remote Viewing Research and Applications by Michael Mumford, PhD, Andrew Rose, PhD, and David Gosling, mm -hmm. PhD, where they give a basic, um, their assessment of of the remote viewing work. And, and if, if I can, I just want to read a few of the bullet points from the executive summary. They say at first, that um, in evaluating the laboratory studies conducted today, the reviewers reached the following conclusions. That is the uh, the authors of this, this study. Um, first, a statistically significant laboratory effort has been demonstrated in the sense that hits occur more often than chance. Second, it's unclear whether the observed effects can unambiguously be attributed to the paranormal ability of the remote viewers as opposed to characteristics of the judges of the target or some other characteristic of the methods used. So um, it's, it's saying, we don't know who actually has this the special power because remote viewing protocols involve multiple people um doing doing multiple things um evidence has not been provided that clearly demonstrates that the causes of the hits are due to operation of paranormal phenomena the laboratory experiments have not identified the origins or nature of the remote viewing phenomenon um though we know it exists. So first they say there is a phenomenon here we don't know what the actual cause of this is we don't know if it's quote psychic or we don't know if it's the the sender or the receiver or both who have some special ability but there is a thing here they they say however um, our evaluation led to the following conclusions the conditions under which the remote viewing phenomenon is observed in the laboratory do not apply clearly in intelligence gathering situations for example viewers cannot be provided with feedback and targets may not display the characteristics needed for the viewers to produce uh, the hits that they need, right? So if you're doing a one-way remote viewing thing, there's not somebody there who can provide feedback on what you're seeing and tell you what to focus on. Um, the end user is indicating that although some accuracy was observed with regard to background characteristics, the remote viewing reports failed to produce the concrete specific information valued in intelligence gathering. Uh, so they're saying in, in effect that there's a phenomenon here it's statistically significant, but 
um, intelligence operations require such a specific kind of information and consistency that we're just not sure that we can use this as an as a reliable intelligence tool so we yes. don't think we need to continue the remote viewing program but there's a myth that's or sort of rationalist myth that's evolved that says well they did the they did scientific experiments and they just didn't get good enough results and so remote viewing doesn't exist but that's not the government's actual summary of, of the situation they just don't know how to use it as a consistent intelligence gathering tool yeah, and maybe it may be like to answer Jason's question about the nexus between remote viewing and UAP. I can, at the end of my sort of explanation of that, go into what, especially that report that you just mentioned, because I think I can sure. put some spotlight, some context on that. So, oh, yeah, let's let, let's get okay. into that. Yeah, let's let's get into, get into this. Yeah. Okay, so this is going to be a really long answer. So stop me to clarify at any time, right? Sure. And this is coming from Ingo's book, Penetration. So Ingo wrote Penetration in 1998. No one would publish it. He put it out um, himself. It has three parts. The first part is sort of his, his fun stories in the realm of interdimensional beings, aliens, UFOs, and structures on the moon um, with um, mysterious groups led by um, Digmatic, Axelrod, and twins. The second part of the book is um, his sort of foray into why the moon is an artificial celestial body. So a satellite, somebody put there. And then the third part is why we need to de develop telepathy to protect ourselves. So that's really the breakdown of penetration. Most people just sort of focus on the first part, which is you know his fun stories and are they real or not? And who's Axelrod, what have you. So, um, I'm going to drill down into this book and I'm going to drill down into just one of those stories. And that's the UFO story. Okay. Great. And um, bring it so on. Do you, bring it on. Yeah. So do you know the UFO story or should I no, just kind of sum? Well, I, I, I know, I, I know the basics of it, um, but I would okay. love to hear your take. And for okay. anybody out there who doesn't know the story, uh, it, this is pretty cool. This is a, an awesome, awesome accounting. Okay. So he's, so um, it's he says it's 1976, and he's having a conversation with Axelrod. It, it's about something else that happened. It happened uh, like uh, his adventures with an, in an LA supermarket with an extraterrestrial. So Axelrod is called to speak to him about this, but he says, "Hey, tell me when you reach a 65 percent threshold, and that and when you do, leave a little note under your blotter at SRI, and then." Um, just to let me know. So a year later, sixty-five percent accuracy in your in your viewing remote viewing. Trial? Um, he he doesn't say, but that's what the we read as the implication. I'll okay. go into that too. But just remember that. Um, so in, it happens a year later. He puts a little note under his blotter, and he says he checks every day for three months, and then um, suddenly after three months, in the dust under his blotter, the little note's gone, and it's written like expect contract expect us to contact you. And then shortly after that, he says it's noontime. And all of a sudden he sees Axelrod standing in the middle of SRI. And um, Axelrod kind of motions to him and um, Ingo follows him. They have this conversation in the men's room where Axelrod's like, hey, um, do you want to go see a UFO? And Ingo's like, yeah, I'm totally down for it. Um, all right, well, we need to leave. We need to leave now. You need to make your excuses, but we need to leave now. So Ingo, it's a Friday afternoon. Ingo, it's Friday noontime, lunchtime. He makes his excuses, heads out the door. They jump in a Jeep. They head towards um, the San Francisco airport. They get on a high-tech plane and um, fly for four or five hours. And they land. It's um, pitch black. They land, and um, Ingo leads us to believe that it's the Arctic Circle in Alaska. And uh, from there, there's a van um, near the, this kind of really small airport that they land at. They get in the van, they drive for two hours. It's pitch black. Ingo says he can see billions of stars, but it's otherwise very desolate. They're in the middle of nowhere. And then um, he's put into a thermalized jumpsuit and they have to walk for 40 minutes, like a 40 minute hike to where they're going. And it's just about dawn at this point. They're just as remote as you can get, you can right, get. Ellie? Like literally yeah. the middle of nowhere. Right. And it's like he says, like a pine tree 
pine tree tundra, but they get to a lake. And so he's kind of settled down, but they have to be super quiet. And then um, all of a sudden, as dawn, right, right after dawn, a mist appears over the lake. And then an object appears out of the mist. It kind of forms in it, into a um, diamond shape or triangular shape. And then it grows really, really large. So like 90 feet, he says it grows into a 90 feet. And then it starts sucking up water. And um, at that point, it becomes aware of Axelrod and Ingo, and it starts to fire on them, and then they scatter. <laughs> like, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. They fire on them? I didn't hear this part. Yeah, it fires on them. It starts firing, blasting at them. So they all run for cover, and, they're, and then it just disappears. And um, they make, you know, they're like, they're all checking themselves out, and they, you know, pretty much for the, for the most part, okay. And they make it back and they get back to the airport and Axelrod's like, what do you think this is? Right. And, and Ingo says, um, well, you know, um, it seemed like it was a drone unmanned from somewhere. It's a triangular shape, 90 foot machine. And then he's like, if you want to, you know, like my way of interpreting it was, it was an apparition. So it just appeared and then it grew, it sucked up water, fired on us and then it disappeared, right? And when they come back, they come back to the airports now day, there's sheriffs, there's cowboys, there's Eskimo women, there's a hot dog cart, and you can see a mail plane that says Alaska mail on it. Um, and they get back on their plane and then Axarod leaves Ingo at the airport. And he, he basically says, um, you know, that's the last time, you know, he's like, hey, I'd love to do this again. You're like, well, that's the last time, you know, another group is going to start taking over from us. Hmm. Do you know what really yes. intrigues me about this is how the, in the world did they know that that was going to happen at that remote location at that exact time to bring him there to, for him to witness this? Yeah, I mean, in the in Penetration, Ingo said, well, the Axelrod character says that they've been tracking it and they know that it will appear at this particular place at a particular time. In the seventies. So yes. what are we capable of doing now? Well, so, so here's what I would say. Um, I would say this entire story is bullshit. <laughs> okay. 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 And um, the reason I could say that, right. Is is because he tells us, he tells us, you know, when he gets back and, and I'm sorry, and then, you know, I'm going to put in some things and I'll just kind of just reference it. It's not, wasn't necessarily in my recap here, but he, when he, when he points out the hot dog cart, he goes, you know, it's an L, a La La Land special. So that's either like in a fantasy or it's in a Hollywood, it's in Hollywood. Right. right. So we have to, we have to do some reading between the lines, right. Um, in between this. And, and the other thing is, Axelrod, so they get back and, and Ingo's sort of questioning. He's like, well, all these people at the airport, I mean, it's a high-tech plane. Don't they know what you're doing? And he's like, well, we've given them a cover story. We're rich environmentalists who are tracking acid rain. And Ingo goes, well, that story is bullshit. So I think basically what he's saying is, um, you know, it's I've made up something and it's bullshit. Um, because I have to hide something. And you're probably like, um, well, how do you know that that's bullshit? Just because he says that, what makes you think that? And um, I'll start by saying, okay, so he tells us he put the signal under his desk in June of 1977 and then checked for three months, which not would not have been possible because he was only sporadically at SRI during that time. He wasn't full time. He was only on a contractual basis. And most of the time he wasn't there. And we have invoices that tell us that. So he couldn't have been there checking every single day. Um, in the opening chapter of chapter 10, so he says he's checked for three months, um, but then he received a reply in July. And I'm like, well, July is not three months after June, right? So already we know there's misdirection. I think he was really telling us something happened in the fall of 1977. So when you have like a check for three months and then it happens in July, right? So you already know something's going on. 
77 is such a huge year for such so a huge much, year. Yes. So much yes. activity. It's crazy. Yeah. So when he leads us to believe it's in Alaska, the Arctic Circle, um, they're arriving at night. It's dark. It's pitch black. And they drive two hours. He sees billions of stars, 40 minutes, blah, blah, blah. I mean, um, we just kind of have to start with the time, he says. He says, Axelrod appears at lunchtime. So let's say noon. And then let's give them 30 minutes to have their conversation in the men's room and Ingo to leave. So they hit the road at say like, let's just say 1230. Well, Alaska is an hour behind California. So it would be 1130 a.m. there. Okay. And so I'll just use Alaska time going forward. Um, so let's say it gives them 30 minutes to drive to the San Jose airport, which is where he says they leave from. And 30 minutes to get on the plane, even though he tells us they take off in three minutes. Let's just still give them 30 minutes. So they take off 12.30 p.m. Alaska time. The flight is four or five hours, so they land at 5.30. That's the long end. I'm totally on the long end. It's the middle of the night, pitch black. But if it's July, that would totally be impossible because the area would be in perpetual daylight during the summer. Alaska is pretty much in, it's, you know, the land of the midnight sun. Good point. Good point. Right? If it's three months... So let's say the beginning of October, sunset is somewhere between 7 to 8 p.m. with there's still going to be light in the sky from the sun. So for another half an hour. So they, they couldn't have landed at 530. Mm -hmm. And then sunrise is 8 to 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. So if I just did some basic back of the envelope math, we can see the story doesn't add up. Right. Um, then we add in the fact that where they land is, he says there's nothing around, not even lights. You couldn't see lights anywhere. That's when they land. But he points out that when they come back to the airport to take off, there's the sheriff, there's the guys, they're in plaid. So I think he's saying lumberjacks, Eskimo women, the mail plane. So if there are people with sheriffs, undoubtedly there's going to be gas stations, stores, some sort of employment place like a mine or a timber operation, homes, roads, things with lights, things that could be seen as a distance, right? So I think he's trying to make it very obvious to us that um, there's something up with his story. And the reason for this comes with an interview he did with Art Bell for his Coast to Coast radio show. I think I mentioned it before. You know, he, he stays in a very narrow path with Val, but it's really fascinating because Ingo talks about, um, he he's talking to Ingo about being harnessed, right? Because he's retired now, but he knows all these secrets. Mm. And Ingo dances around this saying, and I think this is probably pretty telling that historically, if a person such as himself, so he's like somebody with the abilities that he has, refuse to work with them, and he's saying the powers that be, that a person like him wouldn't live very long. Okay, that's a pretty powerful statement to me. That's a bold statement, yeah. Right? Um, and he, he kind of deflects this from being his situation, but I know from his voice that he knows it is. And the reason for that comes a little bit later in the interview. You know, Bell asks him about his next project, and he says, oh, it's about power. And this would be the Secrets of Power books that we know now that he put out. At which Bell comments to Ingo saying, oh my gosh, I don't even, like, if you're talking about power, how are they leaving you alone, right? And, and this is so fascinating. Ingo says, oh yeah, he gets lots of visitors. So saying, yeah, you know, they're not leaving me alone, right? <laughs> okay. And then reiterates, which I feel certain was directed to those who are not leaving him alone, he literally says that I am not a threat. I am not a danger. He says at two points in the conversation, I am only talking about what is in the public domain. Right. And I think it, it's, he's kind of trying to reassure someone. Right. So then since the topic of power is of interest to Bell, this is where I said, He's like, well, what about the president? And they agree it means a generic president. Um, he, Bell mentions Clinton, but they just settle on that it's a generic president. And he goes, the, and Ingo responds, quote, the president works for the real powers which rule the world. So he's, you know, he's saying this is a probably pretty powerful force behind this. Um, and, you know, his meandering around the issue of being harnessed, which he never does answer, um, it's interesting because during the interview, both Ingo and Bell can hear other people on the phone line. 
And King in Ingo comments, um, they are listening in. And I know this from because I served as Ingo's like phone screener. Like I would hear strange clicks and other voices on the line. You know, and back then that happened a lot. Like lines got crossed and you would often hear like there were party lines. You would have, hear other conversations, but this is totally different um, because they can hear it, but we can't hear it as listeners. Right? Um, and when the first time this happened to me, when I lived with Ingo, he, that was when he told me he actually worked for the CRA. We didn't know this when we were growing up. We just thought he was like doing psychic stuff at SRI. That's what we were told. I had no idea. So this was like new information to me when I found this out. And so Ingo was like saying to me, like, you know, if you want to talk about something, don't do it over the phone, <laughs> basically. So Bell thinks that he can just hang up and call Ingo back and this will solve the problem. Um, and Ingo, but you can tell by his tone of voice and like me listening to it years later knows. And as Bell finds out himself, it doesn't solve the problem. It keeps happening, right? So I think we can now just say, just because he put, didn't put everything in that he wanted to put in to his book, um, because he even says this to Bell, and this is a direct quote, if you put the pieces together, you will come up with a story. A story he implies is being prevented from coming together by the powers, which Bell adds, wow, oh, sure have a lot of good reading between the lines for us. And I can almost hear Ingo smiling, you know, and that we do, I would say. So I would say, um, let's start by reading in between the lines. And I think we can start, and this is where I think your interest with the, the people with this kind of confluence between remote viewing and um, the UAP world with remote viewing comes, comes together. So he's described three different things, an unmanned drone operated for somewhere else, this diamond triangular shaped 90 foot machine, and then a transparent thing which fades in from nowhere, materializing out of a fog, becomes vin visible and then dematerializes, disappears, which he describes as an apparition or what he calls an appearance or an object. Okay. So I'll well, kind of just- know those are the things to, to take seriously and not the things to disregard when we're reading um, Well, you know, that's what's hard, right? And so that's what requires us to do a lot of, uh, like he said, reading between the lines but also requires us to use a lot of outside sources, right? And so um, it's something that he taught me. He, he wrote about it in your Nostradamus factor. He, and he, he phrased it as like, it was for future seeing, but it was, hey, if you wanna know a future trend, like information is dispersed. So if you wanna know a trend, like say you wanna know when the volcano eruption is gonna happen, you start reading articles and clipping out things about volcanoes and you put it in a folder, right? You'll start to see a pattern. But if I just read about a volcano eruption like six months ago and six months later, I'm not going to see the pattern. Right. So he's like, information is dispersed. You have to go collate it. So, you know, that's why I wrote this book that I've been working on. It's about decoding Ingo's messages, right, to us. But it meant having to pull in a wide variety of sources, books, declassified documents, his own letters, you know, like hundreds of books. But in the case of this story that I'm about to go through, I think there's only like three or four books we need, a few declassified documents and his own letters. And I think okay. we can pull it together, right? But, he, but you know, he's not gonna make it easy for us because, you know, his life is on the line. So he's going to make it a challenge. But if you love puzzles, it's a you know great puzzle. And I'll, gi I'll give you an example. So we'll, we'll talk about this apparition. So in 1992, Inga wrote this article for Fate magazine. You know, his, his message was, come on, people, we're being kidnapped, we're being genetically farmed. I mean, that was kind of the basic message of that article. So in a penetration, he says... Um, he describes this apparition. He says, supply ship, which he's put in scare quotes, so he's drawing our attention to it, something he wants us to pay attention to or finds disturbing or doesn't agree with. So he says, um, supply ship Earth. Let's drive over to Earth, go shopping and pick up what we need, that kind of thing. Calling it directly a go-to-Earth shopping cart kind of sounds like a farm, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're being farmed. 
So um, he's involved with this one because he said, so, you know, like we have to clip out parts of what he's saying and kind of like put them together like puzzle pieces. So he's saying, well, I guess you guys, whoever you are, have a problem. And from all I can tell, Earth is under some kind of siege. Let's drive over to Earth and get what we want statement. That is seizes things, picks things up, that's sucking things up. He's using the image of sucking up water here. UFOs appear everywhere, are seen by thousands, yet they are elusive. Noting here would be hallucinatory, fleeting, transitory, phantom-like, but of concern. And so you're trying to fit the pieces together. So not one they know appears at regular intervals, right? And I would suppose too that you are desperate enough to try at least to employ psychics to help you out, okay? So in this case, he's not there to see it. He's being hired as a psychic by a group who are dealing with phantom-like things, interdimensional happenings, which takes things and then disappears, noting as he does, a fault part of the problem is that it is a reality problem for us, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is where we have to start puzzle piecing together with outside sources. This group sounds a lot like one that comes up in Jack Belay's book, Forbidden Science, Volume 2. And it comes up in a way that's reflecting a conversation he had with Hal Putoff in October of 1973. He wonders if there was a secret governmental project actively, actively investigating UFOs. Putoff responds, there is, and they often use his, he calls them his, psychics to RV places where they think there are UFO bases. Valet wonders if they know the true scope of the situation and put off response that they know what is at stake and they are officially sanctioned. So does that make, you know, like make sense? We have to cut out pieces and put pieces together. So he's well, basically, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say Ellie, it, it, now, it, I mean, it's all coming out of the woodworks right now with, uh, you know, David Grush and these whistleblowers saying that these programs exist where, we have reverse technology. I mean, there's even talks of bases where we might even be working with some of them. Or so he was, you know, saying this at a time where the it wasn't as prominent uh, in, in normal news. You know what I mean? Like he he kind of knew that something was going on. That it was a big, big operation. That uh, and, and th that's huge. That's huge at that time to be able to predict that and you know at least well, put it in his notes. Right, he's involved with it, right? So put up saying they're using my psychics, that would be Ingo, mm -hmm. right, to find these spaces. And Ingo's saying you need to hire psychics to figure out what's going on. Like you have to put those two puzzle pieces together, right? Um, anyway, so so I guess I'm just saying obviously there's a covert group operating somewhere within remote viewing or using remote viewing to deal with things of a non-human origin. And so mm -hmm. so for you, Michael, I'll get back to that. That's the question about the end of RV. So that leaves us with the story about how they became involved with two kinds of machines, right? The unmanned drone operated for somewhere else and the origins of this large triangular machine, which I think we could equate with the stealth bomber since it's triangular, it's 70 feet. So I think what he's doing is he's extrapolating. So instead of it being a UFO, his reference is instead pointing us to sort of like a revolutionary or high-tech machines or the origins of this revolutionary or high-tech machine, okay? And a clue for this, we need to start with Hal Putoff. And this is from the physics of UFO. This is um, Eric Weinstein and Hal Putoff on the Jesse Michaels American Alchemy Show. It was posted on YouTube February 11, 2022. Hey, Weinstein and Michaels are on a sofa. They look to be in a library, across the sitting across from the Miss put off. He's on his own sofa. They're all leaning back. Weinstein, in my estimation, looks really skeptical. Put off looks like the cat that ate a mouse. And Michaels looks like someone who's just won the lottery. Like he's like, oh my God, because these two people together. So Weinstein's legs and arms crossed, tosses this out the book. Another puzzle we would love to have cleared up is the role of aerospace companies as holders of potentially basic scientific knowledge not shared with the academic world. Is it possible? Seems very wrong to me. Put off responds, it may be wrong, but it's um, true. Weinstein, you believe it's true? Put off, I know it's true. Weinstein, you know there's physics knowledge held by aerospace companies that is not their own? Put off. 
Well, there certainly is materials knowledge. He then adds after Weinstein asks about it, certainly aerospace corporations have knowledge in the UAP area that specifically are sequestered by against FOIA because of proprietary appreciables. That's what I'm the, the implication there being that uh, Freedom of Information Act allows you to request government information but it doesn't allow you to request information that's held by private corporations. So if the government, for instance, has has some crashed UFO that they want to understand, they can just pick it up and immediately hand it over to Boeing um, and say, you figure this out for us. And at that point, it becomes completely inaccessible to FOIA request. Like the loophole, uh, like playing through the loophole. Total, right? total loophole. Yeah. Um, so, right. so that's right. what put up is alluding to. Right. So I think we can take this from a line from Ingo's story. So one of the lines he says is, um, so when he gets to the airport, it's a super high tech jet. And he goes, oh, this is just like when other when wealthy people, one's interested in exploiting sci fly me places. Um, people with a sense of opulence and power who have arrived financially. So I think we can say these are the people behind this one. OK. So my take on this one is that Ingo was picked up by someone or someone working for someone driven to an airport where a private jet was waiting for him. And I believe this happened in the time frame Ingo directed us to the end of September, October, November of 1977. Okay. So in 1974, Valet tells us that, and this is again referring to his Forbidden Science volume two, Kit Green, an analyst with the CIA's Office of Scientific Intelligence, so this he would be the become the program manager of RV for the CIA. Anyway, in this 74 conversation with Valet, Green confirmed there was a group of 15 engineers in the Midwest, which Valet believed to be part of aerospace company slash defense contractor McDonnell Douglas, since it was in St. Louis, owned by James McDonnell, a person Valet calls an aerospace tycoon. Oh, a wealthy man with a lot of high-tech planes in his corner, right? Doing secretly doing UFO research for the CIA under the cover of aeronautical research, okay? So let's fast forward to the time Ingo places the story within. This is 1977, okay? It's a late spring with SRI's um, CIA funding running out and as Annie Jacobson notes in her book, Phenomenon, former astronaut Edgar Mitchell flies to Washington to meet with his friend, CIA director George H.W. Bush to intervene on SRI's behalf. He'll try to get additional funding. But Bush, according to Jacobson, says can't approve the funds because now the CIA is under too much scrutiny from Congress. So Bush tells Mitchell, according to Jacobson, hey, you're going to need to get SRI to find a military sponsor if remote remote is going to survive. OK. Or shall I say, if the secret project, that would be RV, you are using to hide what Ingo calls our attention to penetration, naming it a ultra subterranean, subterranean, that's what, how he refers to Axrod, meaning underneath or concealed covert mission is to survive. So your thing hiding something is to survive. I mean, honestly, how spectacularly clandestine is that? Using a secret project to conceal an even darker one. Like, mm -hmm. like, like how would anyone ever be able to untangle that, right? All right, so if you look at the vast sea of sources, this is when um, the spotlight shifts to SRI finding RV project support from the Foreign Technology Division of the Air Force, right? And then RV being used as an operational informational espionage gathering program by the Army under Gondola Wish, which has now become Real Flame, is receiving funds. But our story isn't about remote viewing, it's about this covert one, right? This, um, as, as he said through Axelrod, the work picked up by others, okay? And the program picked up by others, not RV, but what's underneath it. Because RV, again, its future was secured by Army intelligence. No, this would be that subterranean project, that revolutionary machine. And we can sort that out by whose funding came on board at this time. So this is 7078. And so this is where a declassified document, government-sponsored research in psychogenics comes in. Is, is this all, am I going fast or is this so? Okay? No, you're going no, perfect. No, yeah, perfect. Yeah, keep going. Okay, so I call this the timeline document. It sort of outlines the CIA funding of um, this kind of research. 
And they say that in August of 1977, the Missile Intelligence Agency, known as the MIA, it was born from the work of former Nazi um, space guy, Werner von Braun, and his team of rocket scientists, who There's are actually highly... Right, he's highly interested in um, so Soviet psychokinesis work, so manipulating things with your mind. Um, so the MIA rewards SRI an eighty thousand dollar contract for one year, and that's coming by way of a declassified document on Center Lane. The MIA, per this timeline document, would go on to say that that they would continue psychokinesis work at SRI for another three years and put in an additional two hundred thousand dollars in nineteen seventy seven dollars. So you know that's a boatload of money, right? In seventy seven, yeah, that was a lot. Yeah, yeah. A lot of money. The MIA at this time was responsible for technical intelligence covering foreign tactical air and ground systems. So documents said the objective of the MIA program was to determine the degree to which selective personnel are able to interact with and influence by mental means only sensitive electronic equipment and how this equipment could be exploited for army designed applications. Hmm. Also in 1978, the Army Materials Systems Analysis Agency, which is part of DARCOM, they're the group for providing materials and equipment to the Army, the ones that create Army-designed applications. So they're responsible for making decisions on technology, materials acquisition, designing and developing materials equipment, and sustaining U.S. weapons jumps on board the money train, providing two years and a $230,000 contract. So these same companies... That are funding all these programs are now funding this th this program of, of remote viewing? Well, so here's, I think it's what's below remote viewing. So we have to fold in what SRI was doing. I mean, what Inga was doing at SRI. So at the early part of 77, he was working on a, a remote viewing project, remote viewing like tunnels in the DMZ's area of North and South Korea. It was known as the ARPA. So that was the predecessor of DARPA. Tunnel Detection um, Technology Program. It was joint effort with another SRI researcher, Lambert Dolphin. He shows up in Ingo's chapter on Mars. That is um, where Ingo was remote viewing Egypt and Mars and finding traces of an ancient civilization. So he was doing that for Lambert Dolphin. Um, anyway, that's later on. Um, but at this point, Lambert Dolphin's research is focused on ground penetrating grading radar. But what's important is he's doing this for ARPA. Um, it's referred to internally at SRI as Project T, and it runs through June of 1977, but internal reports documented excess successes in 1977, which means Ingo has demonstrated to ARPA that remote viewing was successful. So here we begin to see the story about reaching that 65% level come into view, and I don't think it was about him reaching 65% since we know so much of the funding to date was based on his successes. Um, I think it was that he was... It, what was successful is him being able to train people to get um, to be successful identifying targets 65 percent of the time okay if that makes sense that his yeah, training so the, when right, you get to 65 percent isn't you but when you as a trainer get to 65 percent with your group okay okay right right okay so in June, Ingo was working on a, a humanist report in a paper for the IEE. He's also starting um, the remote viewing part of the Catalina Island Archaeological RV Project, Deep Quest. He mentions this in the story with Stefan Schwartz and his Mobius group. He's doing this while he's in New York. In July, he goes to Catalina. He actually goes in the sub and they go, you know, looking for the objects that he's remote viewed. Um, according to Valet, Again, in the same, when I say Belay, I'm always going to be referring to Forbidden Science Volume 2. Real estate billionaire Trammell Crow has just financed this project. Oh, so another wealthy person interested in exploiting Zai. Um, so everything about this project, there's film footage. It, it actually appears as an episode of In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy. So everything, the film footage and all his notes show that Ingo's in New York and Catalina during this time. So he's deeply invested in this project. Um, at the same time, Ingo was preparing to speak at Harold Sherman's ESP Body Mind Healing Workshop in St. Louis, which he does on August 4th. He delivers a talk called Psychic Warfare. The following morning, he was invited to breakfast hosted by Crow, whom Valet tells us is a close friend of aerospace giant James McDonald. 
along with the other speakers at the workshop. This is again, according to Valet. So based on a letter from Ingo, which can be found in his archives at the University of West Georgia, he also met McDonald at this ESP workshop. For it seems McDonald is, is at this workshop too, very interested in Psy stuff. And it's kind of here that I would like to extend um, my like deepest gratitudes to a researcher and another RV explorer by the name of Brian Lawlin. So uh, some time ago, he sent me some material and I was kind of getting ready because like I said, this part of my book, um, I just felt like I needed to read his material again. So I did. And in it, he mentioned a certain project. And so I emailed him. I'm like, hey, what, you know, what do you know about this project? Because I've never heard about it. He's like, oh, yeah, I have these letters regarding that. And he sent them to me because he had spent several weeks going through Ingo's archives a while ago and photographed them. And I, you know, had he not, I don't think we would ever know what I'm about to go into. And so when I say letters or reference writing to and from, that's because Brian found them. And you'll see there, I think they're pretty incredibly invaluable. And he's- Is he at really University of West there. Georgia where the archive is? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, so in September, Engel travels to DC for something related to SRI for 11 days. And he's back at SRI doing RV sessions on nuclear test sites. Okay, so now we're hitting that three month mark, right? That starts to come into focus. This is when Trammell Crow writes to Ingo and tells him we will meet, that he will meet him in New York at the end of the month. I think this is the contact. Okay, on October 11th, Valet Note T, Valet, met with Crow in Dallas to give a lecture to a select group Crow has put together. According to Valet, this includes the mayor of Dallas, the Hunts, who are an uber wealthy family, the CEO of a financial empire, the general counsel of GE, a VP for IBM, a VP from Xerox. From my reading about what Valley says this lecture is about, it was about technology used as a revolutionary understanding of the topography of space-time. Oh, could this perhaps be a group of wealthy individuals exploiting Psy for something, <laughs> right? That is you know, crazy. Isn't that crazy? October 17th, <laughs> Leo writes to Crow to tell him the smaller project, Project Day, um, is almost ready, and to fund the other players from so nine psychics, Pro should open a joint account for them, and Stefan Schwartz, who will pay them. So it's some sort of project that Crow is doing with him and Stefan Schwartz. He ends this by saying he will discuss more with him. This is Ingo saying, I'll discuss more with you when I am in Dallas, which seems like it will be shortly. So Ingo's running this this project A with Schwartz and his Mobius group from LA with help from SRI with funds from Crow. And I know Schwartz was very interested in developing ideas about predicting future events. So I think that Project A is related, related to this. Um, but then, which they, which Ingo calls Project A and Crow calls Compass. Um, and Ingo tells Crow, when you visit here at SRI, I can show you more about it. So in November, Ingo starts work on Project A Compass. But here's what's interesting. Both Crow and Ingo refer to it as the smaller of two projects. And now here's where something gets really interesting. On November 17th, 1977, Ingo writes to James McDonald directly saying, quote, thank you for your courtesies you extended to me while I visited you. I found your entire operation amazing in many ways and very encouraging in so many other ways. I enjoyed meeting your friends so much. <laughs> So okay. I'm guessing Ingo Wright was flown in late October, early November, perhaps after that meeting in Dallas with Crow and was shown something. And he met was really others. excited about it. It sounds like, right? Yeah. 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 So then in late November 1977, Crow's funding for this larger of the two projects hits the books at SRI. So it enables the launch of it. They call it Project Xerox. Perhaps related to Valley's lecture with that Xerox VP in attendance, or could it be about copying something or maybe both, right, with Ingo. Ingo writes to Crow to tell him the funding is all set as, at SRI and tell him, telling him as he does, it will take 10 days to two weeks to get first impressions. McDonald, for his part, writes to Ingo and wishes him great success with his work in California. And then Ingo writes to McDonald on November 29th, sending him information on Project Xerox and promises to keep him updated. 
November 15th, 1977, Crow wrote to Ingo to say he wants to talk about the larger project. So is Xerox when he comes there in January. And then in late December, 1977, um, well, this is in late, not that he wrote to him. He wrote to McDonald mentioning, oh, late December, 1977. He writes to McDonald mentioning his wonderful trip through the Southwest to get a psychic orientation of it. He specifically notes the Southwestern part of Arizona of particular interest. So here I find an interesting connection to something Ingo mentioned in Penetration, which struck me. And I remember seeing it as odd when I first read it. He says, you know, when they're escaping the UFO, I was dragged and practically thrown back into the um, Arroyo. Yeah, I'm probably saying that right. Arroyo is a Spanish word for a dried out riverbed found in the desert like places, which would not have been in Arizona, but most mm -hmm. assuredly would have been in the southwestern part of Arizona. So you mean it wouldn't have been in Alaska? Not in Alaska. It wouldn't have been Alaska. So his Alaska was to not tell the location of maybe the desert location that he went to. Because mm -hmm. hour wise, I mean, it probably would make sense why he would have gotten it at that point from his location. Right. Alaska made no sense. But he mentioned that he could see the stars and nothing else. You see that in the desert. There's nothing but stars. So, yeah, nothing good point. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. So, Valley notes in an entry dated January 5th, 1978, he knows McDonnell Douglas has an ongoing secret project, well-funded, with the blessing and official monitoring of the CIA. He hints this is UFO-related. December 1977, January 78, McDonnell goes to Washington to hold strategic meetings with people with connections that make things happen at SRI, according to a letter Ingo wrote to McDonald later that year in June, noting, he says, since the time you talked with certain strategic people, the overall attitude at the highest level seems to have changed a great deal. And I'm like, well, what might that be? This increased work at SRI, I believe, is linked to Project Xerox and McDonald's trip to DC and his CIA-backed UFO project. And here we need the last piece of the puzzle regarding that 65%. And it comes from Ingo himself. So just remembering that the official version is he started training those remote viewers, um, starting with Tom McNear in 82 as part of Center Lane, right? So um, for a different view of this, there's a different declassified document about Grail Flame. More specifically, what the document says is the Army psychoenergetic efforts. So it's a briefing document of some sort outlining three programs under Grill Flame. The INSCOM one with the viewers, um, which is happening, you know, with the Robert Monroe group, which SRI is tasked with sort of reviewing their work. Um, more info on that AMSA, that's the Army Materials Group, funding for which there's going to be a small in-house team to be trained at Fort Ard in California in sort of remote viewing. And then that PK work I mentioned happening under the MIA, Funding, but in this case, the document tells us the work is being done at the Missile Research and Development Command. Okay, so I note a technology and engineering lab. This is at Redstone. And how there are two parts, which the document outlines is belonging to a rather, they, they're going to refer to it, and I think it's a cover story, a benign experiment, you know, affecting a noise generating machine. But like I said, I think that's a cover story. The document says the first part of this project will be at SRI. They call it software and hardware. I would call that training. And the second place is an R and it will take place at Redstone in the labs. So some sort of technology engineering. And here is where it really gets fun. And this comes by way of Jim Mars in his book, Side Spies. So as part of Mars's interview, he's interviewing Ingo. He's talking about the psychic program at SRI. So, um, so as part of this interview, and, and this is recorded in, in the book, Ingo mentions having trained two different group of remote viewers, the ones we know about and the ones we don't. Both went through SRI, but at different times, Ingo says. He told Mars, quote, I can't really talk about the second group. They were kept completely separate you know, from the group we know today. I don't even know where they went. They were much more black and much more covert. Oh, you mean part of that subterranean project? That's just me. Going back to Ingo, I don't think I ever had their name rights. Ingo speculated to Mars that they were engineers, having watched them scour the building for materials to use to construct things seen in their sessions. Okay, so the way he phrased it to Mars, it seems like he's um, they came after the first group when I think they were probably the first. Um, so 
Um, this seems to go into concert with Ingo's parting words from Axelrod, how the work will be picked up others. Meaning I think they're now going to just try to reverse engineer the materials which they have, which are UAP related. That is put offs, they have the material knowledge, but not the physics knowledge, which was probably the reason for him seeing this machine in 1977, where he says in penetration, take an atomic reactor to a viewer who's never seen an actual atomic reactor. What they're sensing can be described as a teapot. So it's like hot and it cooks. He calls this analytical overlay, meaning his way of interpreting it is to put it with something that he's familiar with. Okay. Yeah. Using so, a metaphor. Um, or, or something. Right. A metaphor. Right. So the psych, the, the psychic subject in a remote viewing, when they're seeing a site, they might, instead of calling it an atomic reactor, are just going to use what they know, a memory image that comes closest to it. So he says, if you take the time, this is in the book penetration, if you take the time to let the viewer study diagrams of an atomic reactor and photographs of them and their surroundings, the next time they encounter one, when they see it, they're more likely to identify it correctly. And he continues, a remote viewing no novice can study a book with diagrams of all known atomic reactors. Do you have a book that diagrams all UFOs? So perhaps in this case, Inga's involvement was with a group tasked with reverse engineering, that is to create a diagram of the UFO, one he's learned about from McDonald's friends while he's in St. Louis, started to get a psychic beat on in late November, early December, and then said, hey, I need to see it. I need to see its surroundings. So it was taken in person late December to the southwest part of Arizona where this thing was, so he could help his new novice RVing engineers that was started SRI, presumably in 1978, thanks perhaps that corporate funding initiative under Xerox, the copying of things, then got additional support thanks to McDonald's Washington meeting and MIA funding. So as a postscript to this, it's interesting to note that in 1985, the MIA's name was changed to the Missile and Space Intelligence Center. This is the group that's you know housed um, down at Redstone. This is the same time put off left SRI, he founded the Institute of Advanced Studies so he could pursue his ideas relating to energy generation propulsion. About put off, Nick Cook writes in his book, The Hunt for Zero Point, he regularly served various corporations, government agencies, the executive branch and Congress as a consultant on leading edge technologies and future technology trends. And now he was up to his ears in gravity work. If the U.S. government had instituted a top secret anti-gravity program decades before, possibly, so the book is published in 2001, so I think he's referring to the 1970s and 80s, then chances were Putoff was either directly involved, knew about it, or at the very least had some inkling of it. Cook continued in his discussions with Putoff, particularly in relation to the, quote, unproven link between electromagnetism and gravities, the ones about perturbing space-time, just noting that sounds like Valet's Dallas lecture that I think led to the growth funding of Project Xerox. Anyway, Cook believed Putoff had told him in an indirect way some kind of payoff from these experiments had already taken place. Would that be perhaps the creation of a revolutionary high-tech machine exempt from FOIA thanks to those RVing engineers Ingo worked with? You know what? Congrats. Yeah, you know what? We're going to do a two-parter for this because there's so much more to cover. And I just realized it's almost an hour and 45 minutes into it, but there's so much more to cover. So uh, if it's okay, maybe next Sunday yes. we can fit this in and do part two uh, to cover the other uh, portions. But from my understanding, uh, from what you're saying, is that these government, like big, you know, military complex and industrial complexes are funding these programs looking to get people that could do remote viewing or have psychic abilities, but also be engineers to try to work on this reverse engineering program, which again, if they we look at make the thing that they see, right? Exactly. Or even to operate, maybe they clued in that you need psychic abilities or something to operate or even to do anything in, inside the craft. I mean, if you're a psychic um, species, you're not going to have buttons. You're not going to have an, anything that like what we have. You don't need it, right? That's why, you know, people describe these entities as being small, very thin limbed. You don't need to have physical power when you control everything telepathically or with your mind. 
but it's amazing that this was in the 1970s and now we're 2024 it's you can only imagine what progress they've made since then but just hearing even what ingo was uh, ingo was going through at the time the projects he was involved with who he was involved with how many people were backing this up and fully support in the 70s it was impossible to talk about ufos in the 70s that's like one period that most people never talked about like star wars was out close encounters came out it was a bit of a phase there but 77 such a huge year for so many things and again i'm still adamant on the every seventh of every decade there's always something that happens and, you know 77 87 97 the phoenix lights um and and you got uh, 2027 you got uh, uh John Ramirez saying something's going to happen so it seems like it's on a 10 year cycle but it falls on the seventh year um and it's it's fascinating and I, I i'm i'm totally i need to digest what you've informed us today because there's so many names and per, i didn't even know any of this was attached to, to ingo um it, this is fascinating when i said you're a student of ingo this is what i meant like you know you know this guy's life story you're, you're an ingo very... scholar if yeah, exactly if a student of his but as a, a scholar of ingo scholar. so can can i try my hand at summing up your take on the ufo story and make sure i've got it right okay so ingo tells this story where he says look um axelrod this sort of mysterious figure comes to me and says hey you want to see a ufo and then he takes me um to somewhere that I think, uh, you know, through my descriptions, I'll say is in the Arctic Circle. And I see this uh, craft sort of appear out of nowhere, change shape, become big, suck up a bunch of water, fire on us, and then fly away. And you say, I, ah, so it's an interesting story, but I think it's bullshit because you think that Ingo sewed in all sorts of little details that make the story internally incoherent if you just try to work out the timing right. and the mathematics of like when he said he go and Ingo is not stupid enough to say that, well, this happened in June and then three months later in, um, you know, or this happened in July and then three months later in June. Um, uh, so you're saying he's giving us hints. And if you sort of suss out all those hints, one of the interesting things you find is that he says, well, when, when we were being fired on, I, uh, I was thrown into this Arroyo or, or whatever. This is a Spanish mm -hmm. word for a dried, river bed or creek bed or something uh and that's one of these little clues to let you know there's no royal in uh in in the arctic circle or whatever um but if you work out the timeline of ingo's life and what was actually going on when he said this would have happened he was actually in the american southwest a place where you do get to see lots of stars um and, and sort of the way that he described in in the the ufo story and so what he what actually happened is he went you in on a on a plane not from axelrod but from a bunch of rich tech people who were kind of secretly funding um anti-gravity and exotic propulsion work that was based on reverse engineering uap stuff which was done presumably by some of the remote viewers and engineers that he trained to um either remotely view and then recreate these propulsion mechanisms or to uh, mm -hmm. work with propulsion mechanisms that were somehow controlled telepathically um and and that's where he saw in the southwest some like test flight of um of an amazing uh a propulsion machine that was not uh an aliens but was actually a, a prototype created by these these groups that were that were trying to actually do this stuff who we know were actually doing these things and who produced for instance the b2 bomber which in uh, hunt for zero point Nick Cook quotes a um, a general from from I think the Air Force who says that he's confident that the B two bomber is physically incapable of actually lifting itself using the the propulsion means that it that are are known in the schematics of the thing it just does not have enough lift so it has to be using some sort of exotic propulsion mechanism um, and that's kind of the the big the big story put together but that he he hid that story within this obviously bullshit uh, kind of fantasy so that we could kind of crack it open and find it out for our, ourselves. Is that the idea? Yeah, that's absolutely right. That's, a, and, you know, and based on in, I, in something you said, Jason, you know, their interest initially was always psychokinesis. So manipulating mm -hmm. things. And I think that that is that drone operated from somewhere else. I think they had something that needed to be operated from somewhere else. That's the first part of the story. 
Um, and they spent considerable amount of time and effort trying to operate it um, through mental means and finally gave up because they couldn't and said, hmm. screw it, we're going to reverse engineer it. Yeah, and this, a, right. a joystick on it or whatever. Right? Yeah, right, I, I, right. I'm a, I'm a strong believer that one single person would not be able to be strong enough, yeah. no matter how practiced they are, to operate a craft like that. This would require either a massive mind or minds. If you have a group of people that could focus on the same task, imagine how much power that gives it. What scares the crap out of me is that if they are remote controlled. You know, not remote control, but let's say consciously, whatever these entities are, they control the craft. They are the craft. Their consciousness is the craft. How powerful is that, that your presence there? I mean, when you see these things fly, or in my case, when I saw it when I was 13, above my heads, the craft is conscious. I knew that it was conscious. I don't know how to explain it to you guys, but I knew that the craft was conscious. It knew that my brother and I were directly beneath it. It knew the path it was going on, and it it, it was conscious. Um, it's not the way you would think a vehicle operates. Uh, it has limitations. This thing doesn't. That's why they're able to move and go around planes and psych. It doesn't bother them because they move at the speed of thought. Um, that's what's fascinating. And I think as great as the reverse engineering is for humans, that step in our evolution of the mind control, maybe that's the biggest secret keep us dumb they don't want us to know the potential that we hold mm -hmm. that we have because now we don't need government we don't need to depend on other people we become the very gods we worship you, does that make sense hey, so yeah i off. think that's what that's what ingo well, would say i mean i think yeah. that's what he did say yeah can i throw in an, an, an interesting anecdote here before we go when i was in grad school um when i was doing my phd the very first idea i had for a, a dissertation was actually on philosophy of cosmology and the person that I chose and was like sort of talking with to be my my director is a philosopher named Michael Dexton, just a, a extraordinarily brilliant philosopher. Um, and he's a lot a of Michaels in philosophy. Huh? Yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. So, what's up with that? No Jasons. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> not true. The There's the Jason group, Jason. Oh, that's true, J Jason. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, you got a whole group of people. We'll, Do we'll I? Get back to that. Okay. Yeah, you're great. You're well represented. Um, so, so we um he was telling me over lunch one day when we were just sort of getting to know each other that before he came to USC where I was that Duke University had been trying to sort of court him to become a professor there and, and on the tour at Duke they were showing him all these interesting new um sort of physics and engineering experiments they were doing and they took him to a room where they had a, a bunch of I think capuchin monkeys. And evidently, based on what he says, capuchin monkeys love nothing more in the world than playing with remote control cars, uh, right? You give a capuchin a mon monkey a remote control car and it is just like, it will starve to death playing with this thing. So what they had done is this experiment where they, they gave them these remote control cars, right? And they learn very quickly how to do it and they'll just play like kids, right? And then they put a cap of electrodes on the monkey and figure out what its brain is doing when it's pushing the car forward, pushing the car back, steering it left, steering it right, and so on. And they get to a point where they can just look at the brain waves and they can tell how the car is going to actually move very precisely. They can they can predict it. Um, and then what they do is they actually cut the remote control off and they uh, use those brain waves, uh, feed them into a, a, a remote con a, a radio transmitter, and that's what's controlling the car then so the monkey is pushing the joystick brainwave is firing sending it to a, a transmitter and it's controlling the car the remote the monkey thinks the remote's doing it but it's not then they take the remote away from the monkey and the monkey for a while is is deeply distressed but after a while it figures out that if it just sits there and thinks about moving the car it works so they took him to this room where there are all of these monkeys sitting with skull caps on and they're just like little zen masters telepathically controlling these, <laughs> these driving, you know, our, our, our CV vehicles or, or whatever they are. Um, and that's a totally plausible, I mean, I know that that's true. I mean, there's no reason he has to lie to, to me, but that's telepathy, right? I mean, that is in, in a way, very clearly telepathy. This, this, these sort of phenomena. And this is the monkey. We're apes and we're yeah, more cerebral yeah, than I mean, they are. So what are we capable of? I mean, yeah, exactly. 
and, yeah. and it doesn't have a clue. You can't just tell it. You have to like trick it into doing this. But we we know that there is real research going on still today about this stuff. We know that some of these effects are demonstrable or at least harnessable through technological means. So like that just adds all sorts of you know extra layers of plausibility and mystery to what was actually going going on here. Plus the fact that um that Ingo Swan's life story it, it, as he tells it is wrapped in layers of artistically woven bullshit to try to keep you from understanding but his his, his story does the, it, it gets good when he uh like i said we'll get into the uh, remote viewing behind the moon and, and what he saw there in the second episode next week uh ellie i thank you for your time today this was awesome i learned a lot i think we got two hours worth of recording today which is amazing but the it's so in depth, and you've researched this so well uh, that it, it's a, it, and you need to, to to tell people about this. They need to educate Absolutely. themselves, especially in this field of study. We need to include this in it. And the reason why Michael is on a podcast is that he's a uh, you know he studies philosophy. He thinks outside of the box, which is great because it helps me. I try to, uh, but having somebody else who's who's you know capable of get rid of the human biases, trying, right? Yeah. Well, we're both trying, uh, but this is super important. So we're going to do part two following up next week or probably next episode. If you're just been watching this, I want to say to uh, the viewers and, and listeners as well, I'm going to go to the 2024 contact in the desert uh, event this year. I'm planning on going there. It's on May 30th till June 3rd, I think. A plethora of amazing legends are going to be there. It's going to be an amazing time. Uh, you get to mingle with everybody. Uh, everybody's super awesome. It's going to be my first convention I've ever been at, guys, so I'm super excited. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank, of course, the, the team at um, Contact in the Deserts for for helping me out greatly. And I hope to see some of you guys there. It'd be great to meet the listeners. I have not met one, Michael. I've not met one single listener in Canada that, you know of. that, that I know of. of. Nobody listens to me. Nobody cares. Nobody makes a big deal when I go to Walmart. Um, but no, it'd be great to, go see to Walmart. Them. That's the yeah. problem. Oh, I don't know. Just when I walk in Walmart, I want to be greeted. Um, but it's, yeah, this is going to be awesome. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a great time. Uh, part two is following up right after this episode and, uh, we'll see you again.